When you have the terrorists of Hamas and the sadistic death cult that is the Islamic State on one side and Keir Starmer's government on the other, and they're all saying they're hoping HTS in Syria turns out to be a change for the positive, you realise we really don't have much of a clue. What is the evidence then? Is there reason to hope that stability might emerge from the chaotic aftermath of the fall of the murderous regime of Bashar al-Assad? Or might it become the hub, a source of fresh terror and terrorism for the region, for the West and for the world? And how many of Assad's prisoners and others in camps, including Brits who went to Syria to fight, may turn out to be a threat to the UK? Could the British citizens in those Syrian camps be allowed to return here? We'll look at what we know and we'll look at what we don't. And we'll find out, I hope, what you're thinking. Send me that text, send me that tweet. First, let me welcome now, live to the programme, from Damascus, the Times correspondent, Richard Spencer. Hello, Richard. Hi, good evening. Richard, good to have you here as always. I mean, you've arrived there in Damascus. Can you just share with us your, your first impressions? I know you know Damascus, but your first impressions now of that place and its people. Uh, it, it really quite extraordinary coming to the city today. I uh, didn't know what to expect at all. Um, what I found was uh, a, a mixture of things. I mean, certainly the worst was not happening. Uh, there wasn't chaos. Uh, there wasn't violence. There wasn't gunfire. Uh, and if you compare it with, I mean, a lot of people are now comparing this to the fall of Tripoli when the Gaddafi regime was driven out in 2011. Uh, I was there for that, and that was very chaotic, very violent. There was fighting in the streets for several days. Um, people were being killed and uh, kidnapped. Uh, none of that. It, it looked like a normal, almost a normal day. There were cars on the streets. There were people doing shopping. Uh, a lot of the shops were shut, but some were reopening. Um, uh, the banks were shut. We were told that they're reopening tomorrow, for example. Uh, the, 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 it was really easy to tell who were the rebels and who were the residents. I know that kind of, sounds like a, almost a comic thing to say, but uh, there's a total distinction between the people of um, Damascus, who are very urbane, very sophisticated, um, very stylishly dressed, uh, even though... Um, you know, this is a much poorer city than it was a decade ago after years of war and sanctions. Uh, and the the guys from the rebel groups who, uh, you know, even before the war, the, the, the classes from which those rebel groups came were the, were the provincial and rural classes, the working classes. It's a much more class-based revolution than some of the other Arab Spring revolutions. And they have darker skin, much more weather-beaten faces, um, and of course, you know, that's leaving aside the fact that a lot of them were in uniforms. But it was, it's, 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 it's about that, it's about that sense of, you know, a whole bunch of outsiders coming and taking over the city is, is much more marked than in some of the other uh, sort of revolutions we've seen. But mm-hmm. they were on their best behavior. They were standing guard outside the ministries. Uh, they were being friendly. They were chatting to the locals. Um, people were taking selfies with them. Um, uh, uh, they were um, they were trying to find out what was going on. I mean, you had in that news bulletin. They're still going through some of the ministries and um, uh, some of the, uh, the, the the presidential palaces. I mean, there's a little bit of ransacking of those. But uh, I spoke to a, a, a guy from the northwest, from Italy, one of these uh, HTS Tahrir Sham policemen. He was wearing a, um, a a police uniform from from the Syrian Salvation Government as the as the sort of political wing of Hayat Tahrir al-Sham is called the, the, the actual governing force that's been running Idlib. Uh, and he said he was he was on duty to catch looters, uh, and there wasn't much sign of looting. Really? So yeah. There is a sense of order almost. That's so interesting. Well, thank you. For, thanks for painting that. That picture for us, I mean, no one knows what is in store in the future for Syria, but I, I read and I hear accounts of a feeling of relief and celebration, and you've added your... Your, your interesting observations, too. I guess it's testimony, Richard, isn't it, to, to the human tendency to hope? It's definitely human te- uh, de- uh, tendency to hope. I think, you, you know, I try to get give this sense when I've written about the regime. You know, they, 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 sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, it was just another Arab dictatorial regime and, and, you know, maybe it was better than what will come after. I mean, that isn't what Syrians say. I mean, I've not, I've not been... Uh, well, I've been in a Syrian prison, but I've not been tortured by the by the Syrian security forces. But those who have will say that it is like nothing else. Yeah. The, 
the cruelty and sadism of the regime was beyond anything you see in in, in other, uh, you know, um, Arab dictatorships. It, it, there was a sense of extraordinary sadism, and even people who are I've spoken to um, both inside and out Syrians, both inside and outside Syria, who you know the least jihadi people imaginable, you know, sort of businessmen, feminists. They they all say that whatever comes, it can't be worse than what was there before, and uh, so even without that, I mean, you know, I spoke to I spoke to one guy once years ago now who was who'd been imprisoned by both the regime and ISIS. Yes, um, I had survived torture at the hands of the regime and ISIS, and said that the torture by the regime was worse. So right. people people don't see how it can it cannot get better. Uh, but yes, there's certainly concern about you know what will devolve in the in the months and perhaps years to come as as this um, you know what is a jihadist group uh, uh, certainly a hardline Islamist group um, you know it gets its grip on power. So Al Jalani, the leader of the of the, the power in the land HTS, is saying isn't he that his days of jihadism are now behind him? From what you know of Al Jalani, does that ring true for you? Um, sort of. I think that's that's the, that's the, the question, really. I mean, yes, uh, he was never an Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. I mean, that's that's very true. If you remember the 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 the, the guy who led ISIS during the sort of nadir of its spree of mass murders and beheadings uh, in Iraq and Syria, and he split with um, uh, Baghdadi back in 2013 and said, "We're just not going down that route." Um, but at the time, he was still aligned to Al Qaeda, so um, uh, so you know he was no softy. Um, but since then, he had gradually, bit by bit, um, engaged enough with other Islamist forces. I mean, he's been a prescribed terrorist for for more than a decade, so he can't engage with the West as such. Mm. But he has engaged with other forces, and indirectly, for example, with Turkey. And and he says, or he indicates, that he has been persuaded by them that that a more traditional sort of, you know, soft Islamist path is the way to go, to yes. accept the pluralism of Syria, to guarantee minorities to keep reassuring the West that whatever goes on inside Syria is not going to be a haven for, you know, attempts to, you know, bring down the West or, uh, uh, you know, attack the West. It is going to be a normal government uh, presiding over normal institutions that guarantees the the rights of everybody. Yes. Um, so the proof will be in the pudding, as everyone's saying. But that, that engagement with, uh, with, with the outside world through intermediaries, um, through Islamist intermediaries, through the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, and through Turkey, we're not quite sure what the relations are with Turkey and yes. Qatar are, but there, there certainly are relations there. I think those those are moderating influences. We just we just don't know quite how it will play out. Yeah, I mean, look, we remember, and you'll certainly remember that, in our, soon after the Taliban took over Afghanistan, and uh, and British and American and other Western forces left there in something of a hurry. The Taliban said they were going to be more pragmatic. I, I remember on this program talking about plans by the Taliban to turn cultural sites into tourist attractions. Soon after that, they were back in the Middle Ages. This feels different to you. It does, but partly because, you know, I don't think, I mean, the, the comparison with the Taliban is certainly sort of valid. I mean, it's a, both are Islamist movements. But I think the, the you know, I heard people say, oh, well, you know, the Taliban promised to be moderate. Now, the Taliban never promised to be moderate, uh, and we shouldn't uh, mislead ourselves. And some people in the Taliban uh, told President Trump that they were going to be moderate, and President Trump chose to believe them. But the organization as a whole never promised to be moderate. Uh, it was always fairly clear that it was the once and future Taliban, you know. That, uh, and when they said pragmatic, what they meant was that they would like to be recognised as the proper government of Afghanistan, and indeed some countries have done so, including countries that might try to, like China, have, have, have opened, uh, you know, representations with the Taliban. Um, that's that's on a different level from from uh, Jelani, who doesn't just say. Uh, you know, we're going to be pragmatic and we want to run Syria as a, as a country, that he's also saying that my, our ideology is not the same as it, as it was. Uh, you know, our ideology is more open now. Our ideology is, is um, to include 
um, other sects and religions and beliefs in the government of Syria, and that's not something the Taliban did. And even under its rule, for example, to take the sort of the the thing everyone thinks of, you know, which is the role of women. I mean, you know, the Taliban is not an equal opportunity. Sorry, the um, HTS is not an equal opportunities employer. It's not going to it's not going to pass the uh, the Hackney Council. Um, you know, diversity and uh, uh, inclusion um, parameters, uh, but it does educate women. It has universities, it has uh, it has schools. Uh, its girls go to school. Its girls have jobs. Its women have jobs. Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's it's not it's not the Taliban in, in any of those senses. All right, Richard Spencer. So interesting to hear from you. There, live on the line from Damascus. Now, let, let's turn to uh, and say hello to Zara al Barazi, who's a British Syrian living in North Wales with her Syrian husband. And hasn't been able to go back to visit family in Syria since she left that country in 2011. On the line now. Hello to you, Zara. Hi, hi there. Good evening. So it's good to have you with us, Zara. Look, we're talking, among other things today, about something of a sense of, I don't know, cautious optimism about the future of, of Syria since the fall of Assad and the arrival of this Islamist group uh, a H T S. Are you optimistic about your country, Zara? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's possible not to be optimistic when you've looked at what Syrians have been through. So it's been decades of tyranny. Um, if anyone is following the news, they've seen uh, the pictures of, of torture, and this is this is no shock to Syrians. Syrian knows these stories; they know what's been going on. Yeah, um, but it, it's really shocking. So when you come out of that, um, it feels, I mean, it's a shock to us because we never, I never thought that this would be done in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, but there's so much hope, uh, overwhelming happiness that Syrians are feeling right now that finally this cloak of despair has been, has, has been removed from us. Um, I think I'm, I'm definitely optimistic. We're not naive. I think there's a big difference. Um, we don't assume that after so many years of corruption uh, and, and you know, crimes against humanity being taken place, that overnight the country is going to be heaven. Uh, we know that, you know, we're going to see power vacuum. We know that there's going to be chaos. Um, but we also see that Syrians have for the past 15 years and before that really, you know, been taking part in building their civic space and building their um, skills and abilities yes. to, 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 to go through in preparation for a democratic country. Um, I don't think people inside Syria are as fearful of HTS as the outside world. Um, I think we know who they are. Syrians you know, don't necessarily wouldn't be happy with them leading the country, but we don't necessarily will. Even today, Adjolani said that they will take power for three months just to make sure, you know, they're, they're not, and then and then they will see how elections can be held. Yes. So I don't think we're as scared as the rest of the world of this. We are just scared that, you know, we don't know what's happening in yeah. Israeli aggression, other aggression taking place. Are and, you, you know, what we, yeah. Uh, Zara, are you contemplating going back? I mean, do you think of Syria as home? You've been in in North Wales for a few years now. Are you keen to go to Syria, back to Syria? So me personally, I mean, I'm British Syrian, um, lived in the UK most of my life. Uh, I think the the, the 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 situation of returning isn't something that, it's actually something that the Western media is talking about. Syrians have not got to that point yet. It's, it's been less than, it's been just over 48 hours yeah. um, that the regime has been. Yes. Uh, we're talking about a country that has no infrastructure that's functioning. We're talking about a country still with millions of people. We're fearing what's going to happen next. Yes. So you know, no one's packing their bag to go back. Where we are, though, is there's a lot of Syrians who haven't seen their mothers and their fathers for over a decade, yes. haven't met their nephew or their niece. So that chance that, oh, this is amazing that I might be able to go visit uh, and see family see the place where I call home, I think is very much there. But nobody is, you know, Syria is not a safe place. I think we need to underline that. People aren't going to get up and go there right now. Okay. In the very, you know, the far distant future, potentially, yeah. Okay, you, you need to see how it shakes out like everybody else. But you're clearly, I know, struck by the idea that, that almost anything is better than the regime that's been thrown out, the, you know, the murderous, sadistic regime of, of Bashar al-Assad. 
in the future, though, we'll see how long HDS lasts in terms of governing the country. But, you know, as things stand, we're talking about an Islamist uh, a group which, which has a, a very different idea to, uh, to values, the sort of liberal values you become very used to in North Wales. Does that deter you, the idea of going, taking that sort of step backwards, as it were? I mean, I wouldn't call um, going to Syria taking a step backwards. I mean, I, I think Syrians also uh, have very, you know, very, uh, very good values and values that I share and values very similar to the ones that, you know, I think British uh, people mm. living in the UK have. I think with regards to H, I mean, your reporter mentioned that, you know, those that are in Damascus look very different, which I mean, I, I find a bit interesting because you know hds are syrians um and they're you know from syria many of them are from damascus uh, they're soldiers they're a mix of values themselves so it, it wouldn't worry me because i know syrians very well and i know the diversity and inclusive nature of syrians yeah uh, some of them are very religious uh but you know some of them aren't very 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 different society very diverse society christians armenians kurds arabs and that you know I, I, that wouldn't scare me at all because i don't think their values are very different necessarily all right really great to get your perspective thank you zara that's zara al-barazi there